Yes, um, thank you everyone. Uh, good afternoon, good evening, from whichever part of the world you are in. We know that we have people who are now at eight o'clock in uh, Toronto, Canada here. We are 3 p.m., we are past 3 p.m. We also know that um, uh, in, some, in some other parts of the world also, we do have uh, uh, people who are already at 11 o'clock. So whichever time zone you're in, you're welcome once again to the uh, Business Immigration Seminar. This is hosted, as we said earlier on, by Top McKay Attorneys of Canada. Uh, we have hosted a series of webinars in the last two weeks. Uh, we thank uh, those people who were able to participate in the previous ones. And it's our hope that you will get the, um, uh, you get the needed information that you, that you need uh, today to make your decisions. We know that some people are attending for the, um, for the information. And of course, we know that there are, there are some other people who are also attending uh, so that they can uh, provide this information to uh, their friends and family members. Uh, we are also beaming this uh, webinar live on, on our Facebook page, uh, Top McKay Attorney's Facebook page. So if for any reason you cannot get in at this time or you have someone who was not able to register uh, before this time, please uh, tell them to uh, also uh, join us on Facebook. Uh, to, to get to Top McKay Attorneys Facebook, you just have to type our name and search uh, Top McKay Attorneys, and then you will be able to participate in this, in this seminar. Uh, basically, today we will be going through uh, some of the um, requirements as well as an overview of Canadian business immigration. Um, the overview is, is what we have there on, on the screen. We look at about Canada, and we also look at uh, our top market attorneys. Just say a few words about about our our law firm, our partners, our associates, and our staff. Uh, we also look a bit at the uh, immigration statistics. Then uh, we we'll look at the immigration, the Canada immigration programs. Then we we'll share our, our contact for consultation. Then we we'll take. Uh, some questions. We also want to say that um, Top McKay attorneys, of course, we are accredited to practice in many jurisdictions, but today we are uh, uh, coming to you live as uh, uh, Canadian uh, immigration lawyers. But whatever information you get from this webinar today is not to be taken as a legal advice because under the law, um, you need to consult. Um, your legal advisor or your counsel in order to uh, get information that you can rely on. So we are saying that today um, we are not giving you legal advice. Of course, if you need legal advice, you can, also, you can always come back to us, but we are just providing you information that could be useful um, if, if, if you are considering uh, business immigration or if you are in one kind of business or the other, that has to do with uh, immigration uh, today. So without much ado, uh, we will start. And like we said, please, all our questions and comments, please let us, let us put them in the, in the chat box. And at the appropriate time, we will attend to them. Uh, about Canada generally, um, Canada is um, a country in North America, as we, as we all know, but um, it, is, it is actually the uh, our largest uh, country amongst Mexico, uh, the United States, as well as Canada. Those are the three countries in, in North America, as, um, as we know. Uh, Canada has 10 provinces and, and three uh, uh, territories, and the, and the land mass is about 9.98 million square kilometers. That's like 3.85 million square miles. It is also the uh, second largest country in the world after uh, Russia, and the official language is English and French. That means Canada is uh, bilingual. Why would 
people be considering Canada as an investment destination or as a professional or as an academic destination or as a residential destination at, at this time? Uh, you can literally account of uh, the reasons there. It's a highly developed economy uh, with uh, excellent working conditions. The education system is, is good. The standard of living is amongst one of the world's uh, best. Uh, then Canada uh, welcomes immigrants from all over the world, and that's why Canada is normally referred to as a multicultural uh, environment. I need to tell you a bit about our law firm, Top Market Attorneys of Canada. But first, I want to show you a teaser. I have this tale about, about shoes. A lot of people uh, love wearing very good shoes, but I'm showing you a picture right there uh, on your screen. I'm asking you a question, would you rather wear these shoes? I'm talking about those shoes on the left-hand side. At the end of this uh, webinar, we will look at those shoes and we will see exactly what we think is the issue with those shoes. Um, on the right hand side, I'm also asking you a question. Would you rather wear the, the ones on the right? I already know what uh, most people are answering, but by the time we get to the end of the, of the webinar, we'll ask that question again. I also have um, you know, some recollection about some stories that we heard when we were I mean, a lot of us were much younger when we used to read novels, uh, the story of Cinderella, Cinderella. So I've also, you know, put uh, Cinderella's shoes there for you. And I'm gonna tell you something about Cinderella's shoes by the time uh, we finish this presentation, but just have it at the back of your mind that uh, people do a lot of things to wear the kind of shoes that they wear, but in the case of Cinderella, something, uh, happened. Something happened to Cinderella, and uh, we, we, we also we also look at that very briefly in order to put um, a, a little bit of fun in the information session that we are having today. Now, if you if you want to choose people who are going to advise you, what would you look for? A lot of people would tell me we look at their qualifications. Are they qualified? Do they have knowledge? Do they have subject matter experience or expertise? Those are all the things that you want to look at. And that's why I want to tell you just a little bit about Top Market Attorneys today. We are uh, based in, in Toronto, Canada, as, I, as I've said. We are um, a fully fledged, fully integrated uh, law firm. Uh, we practice majorly in immigration law. Of course, we are also in family law, real estate, corporate and business law. Uh, we handle child custody, other parts of uh, business law, such as uh, mining, tax law, franchise and a host of other services. Um, our, our mission revolves around our clients, our firm and our community. We are very proud of the community in which we serve and we have uh, three partners. Uh, our managing partner is Mr. Johnson Babalola. We have some pictures here just to put uh, a face to the people behind Top Market Attorneys. We have uh, Mrs. Kemi Oduwale, we have myself, I can read you. And, to tell you a bit about Mr. Babalola, he's the managing partner. He's been uh, a top immigration lawyer in Canada for several years. He has expect, experience in all aspects of immigration and refugee protection law. Uh, Mr. Duwale um, has been a, a, a lecturer in law schools before she relocated to Canada and continued her legal practice. She also handles immigration, family law, mental health law, um, aside from other areas of law. Uh, myself, I can read you. I, I'm a transactional lawyer, basically. I have experience in corporate and, and business law. I do uh, uh, real estate. And of course, I do uh, a business uh, immigration, uh, you know, uh, second passport programs and all that. And apart from the partners, of course, we have um, uh, associates and uh, paralegals, immigration consultants, in virtually every area of our practice. So, and we, we are also uh, a, a multicultural, we come from different backgrounds. So if you came to talk my care attorneys, for example, you may most probably find someone who speaks your language. I want us to look a little bit about the immigration statistics of, of Canada, even as we, as we progress. Now, uh, between years 2020 to 2022, 
uh, uh, Canada plans to welcome over 1 million immigrants uh, during, during this period. And looking at the uh, numbers right from uh, year uh, 2020, uh, which, is, which is this year we are looking at, at this year, the number of uh, immigrants that Canada is expecting is actually going up, especially for the economic class, which we are going to look at in a little bit more of detail uh, later on. Of course, uh, there are some other classes of immigration that we'll, that we'll look at, but because today, basically, we are going to be looking at um, economic immigration, uh, we, 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 of course, have some other sessions that, that will talk about the other aspects. Now, um, still looking at um, economic immigration, like, like I mentioned, uh, basically, the, the federal skill program under the economic immigration appears to have been attracting the largest uh, patronage. Uh, but today, because we are going to talk basically about business immigration, we will not talk a lot about the, uh, the, the skilled uh, workers immigration, but just for you to know that Top Market Attorneys has got that covered. Uh, come June the 10th, we are going to have another webinar, and we expect that to be uh, much uh, better attended than this. We're going to have another webinar where we talk about uh, the federal skilled uh, workers programs which is, by the way, very, very popular around the world. Now, people may ask me this question that, well, because of the issues about COVID, because of what has been happening now, what is the position about immigration in Canada, immigration to Canada? I will tell you today that at least as, as of May the 15th, when uh, the uh, Minister of Immigration in Canada uh, had uh, a press interaction. Listen to what he said. He said immigration will be key in post-pandemic era. And that is the minister. His name is Mr. Mendicino. So just to, just to put that information out there that um, even after this, this period, uh, Canadian immigration is still going to be, um, is still going to be uh, as something that um, uh, you have a lot to do with. Immigration is not going away because immigrants uh, actually support uh, Canada's economy and growth. There's a lot of skills acquisition and transfer, and Canada has discovered that it has gained a lot from accepting and admitting immigrants who are qualified to come into the province either as, um, as skilled people, as business people, or maybe because of family re reunification, or maybe they have an issue in their home countries where their lives is at risk, or there's some kind of danger. Now, um, looking at the spread of um, uh, immigration, the uh, Statistics Canada, the body that is uh, responsible for providing information and statistics, about uh, population, demographics, uh, work, and all that, say that um, uh, immigrants are actually, they've started moving to the um, uh, prairie region. And in Canada, we are talking about Alberta, Manitoba, and Saskatchewan. But about 39% uh, of that population, they are still heading uh, towards Ontario. Of course, uh, uh, before this, uh, somewhere around 10 years ago, that figure was uh, much higher than that. Most probably uh, over 50% uh, of, of immigrants coming to Canada have been coming towards uh, Southern uh, Canada, which is uh, basically Ontario. Some of them, of course, go to uh, Manitoba. Now, you also must be aware that there is a, a provincial a nomination program, which attracts a lot of um, um, investors, as well as uh, skilled workers also from, from all over the world. And some of these um, uh, provinces are actually taking advantage of those, of those, um, of those programs. Fifty six percent overall of new immigrants. They are congregated around the three uh, largest um, uh, cities in Canada basically uh, uh, Toronto, Montreal, and, uh, and, and Vancouver. But um, 
it's also discovered by Statistics Canada that um, over 60% of those new immigrants actually come from Asia, and that includes um, a, a Middle East. And uh, Africa, it was found last year, um, now became the second most important source of new immigrants. And this figure has gone up to about 13.4%. Before this, it was, it was from Europe. And out of Asia, the uh, as largest individual source of uh, immigration has been from Philippines, which the number stands at about 15.6%. Uh, but uh, some of the new immigrants still come from a neighbor um, a country uh, to the south of Canada, that's the United States, and uh, of course, UK has 4%. Now, like we said earlier on, the target for new immigrants in, in Canada, uh, we rise to 360,000, which uh, mathematically that, that comes to about um, 1% of the Canadian population. And I've just showed a demographic there just to just for us to have um, um, an understanding of what, of what we're, we're talking about. Uh, you see the uh, increase for Ontario is 1.7%. Uh, uh, and you have uh, Quebec 1.2, uh, you have BC 1.4, and then you see Alberta is, is coming up at 1.2%. So what we're saying is that all these um, uh, larger cities and provinces in Canada attracting a lot of new immigrants. But by the time we go through this um, our webinar, we understand that, of course, there are other um, um, uh, provinces as well as cities in Canada where uh, immigrants don't know about, but they need to know about them. Now, looking at the um, uh, professional work distribution there, uh, you see accommodation and food services, um, construction industry, professionals, and scientific skills, you see that those three uh, to your right there, uh, health care and social assistance, professional, scientific, which of course includes IT, as well as uh, construction, has the uh, largest contribution. Now let's look at the um, immigration uh, uh, programs and how uh, one can migrate to, to Canada. Basically, um, Canada has Two, I can say maybe two major immigration uh, programs. Uh, they look at the uh, uh, federal and the non-federal, which you can call maybe a uh, uh, provincial programs. But uh, generally speaking, we have we have both um, the the uh, federal program as well as the provincial program uh, uh, as it relates to uh, the economic class. That is business immigration and skilled immigration. Now. Just to give a general introduction, there are over 80 immigration uh, programs. Uh, many of them are well known, but some of them are not so well known. But uh, uh, generally speaking, we could say that they are broadly categorized into economic uh, programs. We have, we have the family program, like children's sponsorship, sibling, parents or grandparent. And of course, we have the refugee uh, program also. But by far the one we are going to talk about more today is the economic program, the economic program. Now, the economic program, we have identified uh, a few of the subsets uh, just for us to have a feeling of what constitutes the economic programs of immigration into, into Canada. Of course, part of the immigration uh, program is, um, is, of course, the uh, federal skilled workers program, which we had mentioned earlier on, that um, is, is very popular. A lot of people know about it. A lot of people are applying for it. Some are doing it rightly. Some are doing it. I mean, most people are actually doing it wrongly. And the experience that people have had is that it's, they said they don't even understand how this thing works. But uh, not, not to worry, come June 10, uh, 2020, our top market attorneys is having another uh, a webinar for our federal skilled workers. And we will also discuss the provincial nomination program as they relate to the uh, skilled immigration. So like we said, we have the federal skilled workers program, we have the uh, skilled trace program, as well as the uh, Canadian experience class, the Canadian experience class. Now, those three broad categories actually constitute what is popularly referred to as the um, 
uh, uh, Federal Express entry. The Federal Express entry, there's a, there's a pool of candidates that the, um, the, the computer system has given access to where uh, people can register, as it were, their interest to come to Canada as a skilled immigrant, as a skilled immigrant. Now, we also have the uh, federal business and investor programs, and we are gonna look at um, a lot of them today. We also have the uh, provincial nomination program uh, of which, of course, some provinces are actually taking advantage of them, of them right now. We also talk about, about those. Of course, apart from that, we have the regional programs uh, and temporary immigration programs, basically uh, study permits or work permits. Then last but not the least, we will also look at uh, what we have started calling a fast track program. And that's the uh, temporary foreign worker program, the um, uh, owner operator um, a program. So basically that's, that, that's just the general overview. I've said something about the Federal Skilled uh, Workers Program. That's what you see there on your screen. Uh, usually what happens is that there are some minimum requirements or maybe we can say selection criteria that is used to uh, admit uh, will be uh, applicants into, into that program. They talk about the skilled work experience, language ability. Uh, Canada is bilingual as we know. So uh, the candidates are tested for English and French. Then uh, they also look at education, they look at the proof of funds. And then of course, there are some other um, requirements, um, medical requirements, admissibility, criminal checks and all that. So those are the things that the Federal Express Entry uh, Program looks at, even along with uh, the Federal Skill Workers Program. The, the last draw that was done, uh, usually there's a draw every fortnight. The last draw um, was a 447 points. That was any candidates who had 447 and above were given what we call an invitation to apply and they will start their journey for um, application for Canadian permanent uh, residence. Now, for the provincial nomination program, there is an agreement between the um, federal government of Canada as well as its provinces on how to allocate the uh, positions or the opportunities for immigration that there were. Now, every year, this um, agreement is, is renewed because what happens is that the federal government gives allocation to each of the, of the provinces and the provinces, they look at what they need most at a particular time. So some of them have uh, actually come out to uh, give opportunity maybe, for example, to uh, business investors. For example, if the, if the province feels that for now they need more, they need to develop more of the agricultural sector, they may actually have uh, an, an agree uh, a program which will give uh, selection criteria for people who have um, experience or people who have uh, the uh, uh, kind of um, money or the finances to start a farm in that particular province. So that is, that is the way the provincial program works. Of course, there's a lot of other um, uh, uh, system that the provinces uh, would use. A lot of them rely on the uh, Federal Express Entry uh, program in order, to, in order to pick their candidates. Some of them are uh, even just uh, are paper based. Now, we want to look at the uh, business and um, investor, investor programs. Generally speaking, the aim of, of a program is to ensure that um, experienced individuals who can contribute to the uh, Canadian economy are given opportunity to come into Canada. Uh, on the whole, the, the um, a requirement, for example, for, for net worth, usually is between 500,000 Canadian dollars uh, up to about, about 10 million. Uh, Canadian dollars, but we're talking about network that is uh, looking at the assets of the uh, would be immigrant. But of course, there is a program uh, in um, uh, uh, Nova Scotia 
of course, which is uh, the, the minimum um, and net worth is, is looking at 600,000. Um, Ontario in, in July last year actually slashed its uh, minimum net worth. It was about a 1 million. It came down to uh, 600 as well as uh, 400 respectively. But there is a, there is a BC PNP, there's a, um, a British Columbia a provincial nomination program, which was on a, on a pilot basis uh, uh, last year. And the, and the minimum net worth uh, given was 300,000. So that's an exception to this, to this rule. But the uh, investment that that uh, program is, is, is looking at is about 100,000 uh, Canadian dollars. Of course, um, if you're used only to, to the uh, USD, you need to do um, a quick um, exchange uh, right, right there. Now, a lot of them are also looking at um, experience. What is the experience of the investor that is, that is coming in and applying for a permanent residence in, in Canada? Most of the time, the uh, provinces would prefer as uh, someone who had owned a business as distinguished for someone who merely managed the business. But now, under the, under the regulations, under the rules of most of the provinces, they accept both business owners who must have been taking a business decisions like committing capital, hiring and firing, you know, looking at the policies of, of, the, of the organizations, uh, dealing with uh, accounting, doing marketing and all that. So they want to look at that, but at the same time, uh, anyone who has managed a business for a particular number of years, depending on the, on the province, are also uh, are given an opportunity to apply for uh, a permanent residence. A lot of the provinces, of course, because remember, this is a provincial nomination uh, program. It means that the, the province, out of its own allocation or out of its own quota, has given that applicant one ticket, as it were. They've given one ticket. So uh, the, the, the province will try as much as possible to ensure that that uh, applicant actually settles in that province. Now, most of the provinces actually make it a part of their requirement that there must be an intention, intention to settle in their particular province. But what happens ultimately is that um, uh, Canada's constitution allows uh, residents to live anywhere in Canada. But as of the point when the uh, applicant or the, or the new resident is landing in Canada, let's say for example, that um, a resident came in through, I mean, say Ontario, for example, maybe it was an Ontario nomination program. Um, the uh, visa officer has the right under the law, the regulation to refuse admittance to a new resident who though is coming on a, an Ontario PMP who wants to land, for example, in PEI because unless there is evidence, maybe like a ticket or like a, a bus ticket that shows that he's going uh, en route a PEI to Ontario. But uh, nevertheless, the um, uh, constitution of Canada allows each uh, permanent resident to reside anywhere. They can work anywhere, they can reside anywhere, they can study anywhere. Now, the first one we want to look at um, is a federal program called the Startup Visa Program, Startup Visa Program. Now, the, the Startup Visa Program uh, are basically is designed to uh, target uh, immigrants and uh, 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 prospective residents who actually are entrepreneurs and they have skills and potential. They want them to come to Canada and build businesses, but these businesses must be innovative. It must create jobs for uh, Canadians, and then it must compete on a global scale. Now, you will say that is, that is a very good order, right? I, I won't say it's a tall order, but it's a very, very good order. Now, but in order to qualify for this uh, program, basically the uh, applicant must have a qualifying business. And there are some criteria by which the qualified business are actually chosen. The um, uh, start of visa program is, is arranged in such a way that the uh, immigrants should have a, a letter of support from a designated organizations. And these organizations 
uh, like uh, uh, business incubators and all that, uh, uh, angel investors who will actually assist the um, uh, federal government to look at the business proposal and then discover whether or not, for example, it meets those uh, criteria because what usually happens is that the uh, immigrant is not actually coming to establish that business with its own funds. It is these organizations, I'm talking about the uh, venture capital uh, businesses, I'm talking about the business incubators, as well as the angel investors, they are the ones that will provide the seed money. But before you can get any of them to provide their seed money, you as a prospective uh, immigrant, you must be able to convince them that at least uh, the bottom line is assured because they are, they are business people and they are in this to make money. So they will ensure that your business plan, as well as the strategic goals, as well as the objectives of, of, of the business, uh, actually falls within the uh, criteria set by government. Of course, the, as with every other Canadian uh, program, uh, there must be evidence that the uh, applicant or the, or the immigrant meets the language requirements. And the language requirements uh, for uh, applicants under the start of visa program is just CLB 5. It's much lower than what you need to get into the express entry pool because these, these are, are, are business uh, owners. These are, these are people who want to uh, come into business. They do not require a higher level of proficiency in English or, or French as the government would desire of someone who, who was coming in uh, to get an employment as a skilled worker. Now, the applicant must have settlement funds. That's the way the, the government has graduated uh, uh, those, those funds. Uh, for example, if the person is coming in alone, we'll probably have something between 12 to 13 to 14,000. And then with additional family member, the amount would actually increase. I want us to look at the a qualifying business. Always look at the qualifying business. Now, for the business that we are we are talking about, the applicant must have a minimum of ten percent of of the um, the, of the voting rights of that of that business, and then the um, the designated organization we are talking about the venture capital, the angel investors, as well as the uh, incubators, are uh, together must hold uh, more than fifty percent of the total voting rights of the corporation. Now. You may, you may ask me why are those requirements put in there? Uh, basically, the, the government will want the um, applicant to actually have something like an interest. He must have a stake in that business. And at the same time, the uh, funders of that, of that project must also have like uh, something close to majority uh, shareholding. By the time you combine the number of shares held by the applicant and the decimator organization, it comes to uh, over 50%. Uh, and as at the time when the uh, applicant who will be successful for the startup visa program arrives in Canada and start the business, he or she must remain in Canada to actually manage the business from within Canada. So the startup visa program, we must know, is not one of the uh, passive uh, investments that you have elsewhere. Actually, most of the uh, um, um, provincial nomination uh, programs and, and the businesses, they are not, they are not passive, uh, they are not for passive investment. I, I think for now, only the uh, province of uh, uh, Quebec, uh, before the Quebec Investment and Innovation Program was temporarily suspended last year, was the only um, a passive uh, investment destination for uh, investors. I want us to look at uh, self-employed persons. The self-employed persons. Um, you know, I, I said from the beginning that there are so many programs in, in Canada that uh, a lot of people do not know about. Now, the uh, self-employed persons program has been there since the early 2000s, but a lot of people do not know about the self-employed persons program. We'll take a little bit of look at it. And if you, if you look at the screen, uh, you will see things that looks like arts, music, 
athletics. That's exactly uh, the, the class of people that this investment program is actually meant for. Now, what is the objective of this, of this uh, program? It's meant to allow people who are in a designated occupation uh, to be eligible to also uh, arrive in Canada and come to Canada as, as permanent residents. Now, you know, we had talked about the skilled immigration program, and we mentioned the federal program. We talked about the startup visa program. Now, for someone who probably does not have enough capital, for example, to go into some of the provincial nomination programs, some of them that we are going to look at, like we said in the beginning, you, you remember we said that uh, for most of the provinces, maybe except the province of um, uh, BC, most of them, the minimum net worth is 500,000. Now, but let's look at a situation where, for example, you have uh, as someone who is, who, you know, is into self-employment in any of these uh, areas that we are looking at. He doesn't have the, uh, he doesn't have 500,000 uh, a minimum uh, net worth, and he doesn't have maybe 250,000, which is the uh, amount of eligible investment that he's supposed to put into that province. The uh, self-employed uh, program is surely an avenue for such uh, a prospective immigrant. But of course, there are, there are some uh, uh, criteria that the uh, prospective immigrant needs to satisfy. So basically, the, the applicant needs to have experience in cultural activities or athletics that will uh, give a significant contribution to the cultural or, or the athletic life in, in Canada. Now, in order to qualify for this uh, program, you do not need to uh, maybe have a, a profile in the Federal Express entry or have a very high um, um, ILTS uh, scores. But let's look more closely at the uh, scope of cultural activities. We are talking about the professionals or the professionals who can actually apply as self-employed persons. We have a long list there. You can see authors, writers, uh, athletes, creative and performing artists, managers, musicians, painters, sculptors, uh, visual artists, creative designer, craft persons. Now, what we're trying to say here is that unless you, you seek uh, some kind of assessment, unless you seek some kind of uh, uh, information from professionals who should know what immigration program you will qualify for, you may never know, for example, that you could come to Canada as an author or as a writer. Now, the minimum number of uh, points that uh, a prospective self-employed person need to score is just 35 points. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was, that, was, that was really surprising. And uh, that has been kept like that ever since the program started. There's not been any kind of uh, uh, changes to this. Um, we are not clairvoyant. We don't know whether this will change tomorrow, but as of today, the minimum number of points that you need to qualify to migrate to Canada as a self-employed person is 35 points. Now, let's look at how the, 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 the 35 points are actually distributed or how you can actually uh, uh, qualify uh, to migrate to Canada as a self-employed person. Now, Experience, you need to have minimum of five years experience in any of those uh, professions that we, that we looked at before. I just circle back there quickly for you to look at once again, uh, author, uh, athletes, managers, musicians, painters, sculptors, and all that. So you, you need to have a minimum of five years experience. Now, if you have five years continuous experience, full-time experience, you will be allotted 35 points. Easy, isn't it? Yes, it is very easy. Now, um, of course, the uh, criteria also looks at education, but um, lack of education is not uh, a, a bar to someone qualifying as a self-employed person, but basically the person should have a language ability to be able to converse in any of uh, Canada's two uh, uh, languages, uh, that is either English or French. But uh, there's nothing wrong in having, for example, a PhD or a master's degree or a bachelor's degree, it will add to the points. Now, for age, the prospective applicant should be between 21 and 49 
yes. And then adaptability is looking at a couple of other factors. Uh, for example, that talks about um, how well can you adapt in Canada? Have you visited Canada? Have you studied in Canada? Does your spouse have Canadian work experience and all that? That's, that's what makes up the other six points. But uh, sincerely, if you look at this uh, program, once you have full-time experience for uh, a, a minimum period of, of five years, you could actually be very close to uh, the um, mark. You could be very close to what we are, we are talking about. Okay, just um, trying to. So as, as we mentioned earlier on, uh, no minimum education is required as long as you meet the uh, basic um, uh, selection criteria, which we shared on the previous slide. Uh, there's no minimum capital requirement, but uh, the Canadian government expects that you have sufficient funds to be able to support yourself as well as uh, your dependents, of course your dependents, uh, your spouse and, and, and children you need to be able to show that uh, you will not become a liability on the Canadian government. And of course, the only capital you need is a capital that you require to be able to, to start your business. Now, the, 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 the second program that we want to look at is another federal program, and this one is called the Owner Operator Option. Now, I must be, I must be worried in saying this, this is a program. It is, it is uh, we are discussing it here under a federal program, but let me say this uh, 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 quite so simply. There is no program that is called the owner operator program. Now, what we have is um, a, a temporary foreign worker uh, a, a program, you know, on the, on the federal side that the regulations can allow a, a prospective uh, a business owner to buy a business, come into Canada, get a business work permit, and actually manage that business from within Canada. We will, we will look at uh, some of the criteria for um, actually achieving that. But once again, there's no program called the owner operator program. It's just an option for uh, investment. And, and because it is, it is uh, some of the time it is actually faster in the, in the timing within which the investor can come into Canada, it is actually preferable to some of the provincial uh, business investment programs, as we will find out uh, shortly. So basically, as, as we said, uh, these, are, these are people who create jobs, and they are therefore given an opportunity to uh, buy a business and relocate to uh, Canada uh, to manage that business by themselves. So what are the steps to be taken by a, a foreign investor? The foreign investor needs to uh, identify uh, a, a business in which he has uh, some kind of experience because even though there's no uh, a criteria for business experience, of course, if you, if you come into Canada and you file your applications with the uh, um, IRCC, uh, the, the immigration uh, in Canada, they will look at the application to be sure that number one, this is a legitimate business acquisition and business purchase. And then secondly, they will also want to know that um, you, you, you have actually gone into a legitimate purchase acquisition. And there are ways in which to structure that acquisition such that the uh, issues about uh, approval of the, of the whole enterprise is actually taken care of. And you actually need professionals to do that. Now, so, so like we said, the investor must own uh, at least majority shares in that business. So let's take a very good example. You're, you're a businessman and you have a business outside Canada. Now you have the opportunity to invest in a, a particular business. Maybe it is high, high tech uh, business here in Canada. Uh, maybe some kind of a home care business or you know, any, any type of business in which you, you have the experience. So what you do is to look for that business to, to buy. You negotiate the uh, purchase acquisition with the current owners of that business and the funds with which you are purchasing the business is not going to your uh, legal advisor, it's not going to your consultants, it's not going to anyone, it's going to the business sellers. The one who owns that business as of now is the one that 
you need to have that uh, a purchase agreement with. Of course, uh, there's a procedure for business acquisition uh, within Canada, which of course uh, information uh, you, you can you can receive if you approach your uh, consultant or your or your lawyers to give you that 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 kind of um, advice. So when you when you buy that business, it must be that you own a minimum of 51%, and that's a controlling shares in that business because you are supposed to be a majority owner so that you cannot be fired from that business. Now that is very important for the for the purpose of approving that whole transaction. Um, there's a little bit of complexity around it, but with proper uh, guidance and you know, with very good experience, um, you, can, you can actually uh, use that opportunity of an owner operator uh, uh, option to uh, get Canadian permanent resident. Now, I want us to go into the uh, uh, provincial programs. We had said earlier on that um, the uh, business immigration programs have uh, basically fall into either the uh, federal uh, uh, programs or the uh, provincial program. We've looked at some federal programs. Uh, a part of them, of course, was the uh, owner operator option. We've also looked at the startup visa program. And we look at the self-employed. But now we are going into the provincial programs. And like we said in the beginning, we said that the uh, uh, streams in Canada is organized such that there is the federal line where uh, people can apply to uh, the, the, the federal government directly through the IRCC, or you could actually go through one of the provinces. And there, and there are many of these provinces, we are going to look at just, just a few, just, uh, I mean, sample of the, of the business immigration programs from the, from the provinces. But please bear in mind that these are not the only uh, business investment or the entrepreneurship programs in the provinces. We're only uh, choosing some because there's, there's something we want us to see uh, there. So uh, in no particular order, we're gonna look at um, the Manitoba business investment stream first. The uh, minimum network that they are looking at there is uh, 500,000 Canadian dollars. And maybe I need to explain a little bit about the uh, minimum network. I know for, for most people, uh, we do know the difference between the uh, network requirement and the uh, investable uh, funds are requirement. Now, for every of the province, they look at the uh, total assets of that particular investor in order to admit that investor into the province. So for um, uh, Manitoba, they are looking at a minimum of 500,000. Now, if, if your um, uh, total assets is $35 million, you're qualified. If your total asset is 501, a thousand Canadian dollars, you are also qualified. Now, um, the investment amount that is required for this uh, program is uh, 250,000, but that is only if you're setting up your business within the uh, Manitoba capital region. Of course, the Manitoba capital region is, I mean, is looking at those cities that are, that are closest to uh, Winnipeg, which is the capital of Manitoba. But if you are ready to invest outside the Manitoba capital region, uh, the minimum investment they are looking at is 150,000 uh, Canadian dollars. Of course, the, the government policy behind that uh, move is to ensure that the cities and the communities outside the major capital cities in Canada also attract a lot of investment. Of course, you could, you could have net worth of $20 million, and then you could have about $5 million to invest out of it, and you still want to invest outside the Manitoba capital region, you are still qualified. English language requirement um, is a minimum of five points in the IELTS, the International English Language Test uh, Scheme. And of course, like we said earlier on, this is not as, um, as high as that one requir required for a skilled uh, immigrant. Now, the uh, government expects that uh, you, will, you will go on what is called an exploratory visit to uh, Manitoba, and this will uh, give you an opportunity to actually see the business environment, uh, meet the professionals who will guide you as to how to establish the business. You speak to the tax consultants, you speak to the lawyers, 
uh, you speak to the real estate consultant, you look for where, uh, for example, if you have younger children who needs to go to school, you look at the schools where they will go to. And of course, you visit a lot of uh, factories, a lot of manufacturing uh, uh, companies. And of course, that is when you meet the sellers of the, of the business that they know will give you an opportunity to see the uh, working environment and the business environment in that, in that particular uh, province. Now, the second one we want to look at is uh, Saskatchewan. Now, uh, at the beginning, we did mention something like a general overview of, of some of these programs. And uh, immediately, you will begin to see uh, uh, some of these uh, similarities. Now, just like for Manitoba, the minimum net worth for the Saskatchewan immigrant uh, a, a business owner is $500,000 Canadian dollars. But you need to have three years of uh, business experience in the past 10 years uh, as either an active business owner or as a senior manager uh, in, that, in that business. The minimum investment required now, this is where there's a little bit of difference between Saskatchewan and uh, Manitoba. So the minimum requirement is 300,000 for Saskatchewan. And then, um, uh, well, of course, that would be in either um, Regina or in Saskatoon, uh, which, are, which are the prominent cities in, in Saskatchewan. But if you, if you want to invest in any of the other communities outside these uh, metropolitan areas, you could invest up to 200,000. And this actually uh, uh, compares, uh, would you say more favorably or less favorably with the uh, requirements of, um, of Manitoba. But as for, as for most of the other businesses also, uh, you need to have a minimum of 33.3%, uh, that's at least one third uh, percent. You, you could either buy a business or you could, or you could start a business uh, on, on the whole. But most importantly for the government, you need to um, ensure that there is a job that is created for at least one Canadian resident or a Canadian citizen. Now, for most of the business immigration programs, there must not be a Canadian job loss. There must not be a Canadian job loss because one of the reasons uh, Canada is opening its doors is to ensure that uh, jobs, that there's job security for Canadian citizens and permanent residents, and um, you, you cannot come in as, a, as an investor and, and sack all the, all the workers in that business. Um, if you want to grow the business uh, um, from the beginning, you could as well uh, start a business uh, from the word go. Now we want to look at the uh, uh, Nova Scotia Entrepreneurship Program. Now, there's another difference for Nova Scotia. Nova Scotia has an age limit. They have an age limit and the age is 21 years. We're talking about the uh, entrepreneurship uh, stream, but the minimum net worth is slightly higher than what we saw for Saskatchewan, as well as uh, Manitoba. We're looking at um, 600,000, which is about 50,000 uh, more. Now, but for the experience, they're also looking for three years business experience, um, including 33.3%, uh, but this period is in the last 10 years, or if the person is a senior manager, it must be a five years experience in the last 10 years. Now, the investment uh, required is very similar to what we saw for Manitoba. It's 150,000 uh, Canadian dollars. And um, if you're taking over uh, a business, exploratory visit is required. Now, I must make this very clear here. If you wanna start a business from the scratch, you are not required to do an exploratory visit. Now, what is an exploratory visit? An exploratory visit, as the name implies, is a visit you undertake to a location or to a business or to a place in order for you to explore the conditions under which that business is being run. So if you are taking over a business, the government uh, does not want you to say, oh, the reason the business is not making profit is because I didn't have opportunity to look at their business environment. Now, but if you were to start a business, and then you want to grow it organically, then you don't need to do an exploratory visit. But if you apply to um, uh, the, the, the uh, Nova Scotia immigration, and then you say you are buying a business, they need you to file a report showing that 
you have visited the business, you've discussed with the uh, uh, owners, you've seen their books, and you, and you already know how they do business. Now, to, to also make this clear, uh, for most of the uh, uh, provinces, I think apart from uh, New Brunswick, and we'll look at New Brunswick next, but for most of the provinces, uh, you will not get a PR on approval. The way the process goes is that when you, when you do your exploratory visit and you buy the business, you will file your business, uh, maybe your business research report or business plan or business establishment plan, depending on the name that the province has given to that document, you will file that and immigration will go through it. They must be able to ascertain that there's a genuine intention for you to establish that business. You have the financial capacity, you have the experience, you have the skills and you have the willingness to settle in that province. Then when it is approved, the province will grant what is called uh, a work permit. For most of the provinces, that is what they do. They will grant a work permit for one year and then they will allow you to manage that business for a minimum a period of time, anything from between uh, a year to about two years, then the um, uh, investment office, investment office of the particular immigration office of that province will do their usual due diligence to ensure that number one, you are not breaching any of the terms of the agreement you have with the province. You have not laid off any Canadian permanent resident or, or citizen. And you, know, you have not done anything that will uh, you know, offend the immigration laws of Canada. It is only after that 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 uh, province will give a nomination certificate. And with the nomination certificate, you can then apply to IRCC, which is the federal, which is the central immigration uh, body in Canada for permanent residence. Okay, so I just I just wanted us to to understand that clearly. So we are going to look at New Brunswick now. New Brunswick is totally different from all the other uh, uh, three uh, provinces that we have looked at. Now, they are similar to, of course, uh, Nova Scotia in the age, but they are a bit more generous for people who are, are slightly older than uh, 49. Uh, the, the age bracket is between 22 years and 55 years. That means somebody like me can still qualify. Now, for the uh, minimum net worth, they are looking at 600,000 uh, uh, in net business or personal assets. So, so let's say, for example, we're talking about your property, talking about your cars, your yacht, your uh, investment, your, your shares, your gold, anywhere it is in the world, whether it is in Canada, in form of a, a, a personal property, in, in form of uh, bonds or shares, or maybe it's in Dubai, maybe it's in New York, Maybe it's in the, you know, at Toronto Stock Exchange, wherever it may be, as long as the personal network verifiers, um, um, you know, employed by government are able to verify that those assets actually exist and you actually uh, got the assets legally, because you must be able to prove how you got the, I mean, how you got those, those, those assets, then um, as long as you are able to account for 600,000, in any of these ways, then uh, you have the minimum network required. Uh, experience is very similar to what we have, three out of five years, or five years as senior manager. Uh, the investment uh, amount required is 250,000, but there's a refundable deposit. And that is one major uh, difference between the New Brunswick Entrepreneurship Program and the um, um, Nova Scotia, the uh, uh, Saskatchewan, and then the uh, uh, Manitoba. Now, so they want a non, a, a refundable deposit of 100,000. Now, why are they asking for 100,000? They're asking for this money because they want to be sure that you are a serious investor. Now, um, there is a, there's a saying that says that um, wherever you have your gold, wherever you have your money, your heart will all, always be there. So. If you, if, you, if you put down a deposit of 100,000, definitely you will do something to salvage that money. So that is why that, that uh, investment amount, I mean, that deposit amount is actually uh, uh, required. Now, but another very major difference between New Brunswick and all the other provinces we've looked at 
is the very interesting issue of the fact that once you are approved, once you are approved by the New Brunswick uh, Entrepreneurship Office, you get a PR. So unlike what we saw in Manitoba, Saskatchewan and Nova Scotia, you don't get a work permit, you are landed. And because of the uh, obvious advantage that uh, New Brunswick has over the other uh, provinces, uh, we've seen a lot of inquiries and we've signed up a lot of uh, investors for New Brunswick, if not for nothing, but for the fact that they don't have to go through a, a work permit where the uh, province is coming back to check whether or not they've gone through or what they are supposed to do with their business plan, whether they have implemented their business plan. So we, next we are gonna look at uh, BC. And like we said earlier on, we said there was something very interesting about, about the BC uh, program because this is where the uh, um, um, BC uh, PNP office actually introduced a pilot program last year, some, somewhere in 2019, uh, where they actually uh, uh, reduced the minimum network required for the for the for this uh, stream to encourage a lot of investors to go into the hinterland in in bc now but we are looking at their major uh, entrepreneurship uh, uh, program so the minimum network here is 600 000, uh, very similar to what we saw in new brunswick of course uh investments required there's a bit of a difference there we are looking at a minimum of 200 000, but if you're proposing a key staff member and that's and that's very interesting so a key staff member for example can be ceo or for example looking at the cfo somebody who controls the uh, finances or somebody who's like a, a strategic director so if you are proposing a key staff member they expect you to put in a more into into that business but the the number of years of experience are very very similar to what we've seen a minimum of, of three years uh, expression of interest is, is, is required. And oh, I, I remember for Manitoba, there's a requirement of an expression of interest. Actually, that is the first stage of what uh, a prospective applicant needs to do. So you need to uh, do an expression of interest uh, to the province to basically say, my name is Mr. or Mrs. So and so and so. My, my uh, network is so and so. The business I want to buy is so and so. This is the strategic direction where the business is going and you submit it. Now, if they, if they look at the expression of interest and you meet the, the cutoff, they will actually now allow you to go to their second stage. So uh, for the same thing with uh, uh, British Columbia, they also required an, an expression uh, of interest uh, before you come into this uh, program. Now, uh, but BC, we usually grant a work permit uh, for between 18 to, to, to 24 months. And then when the business proposal is fully implemented, then um, you can actually uh, be uh, recommended for a permanent resident. But it is important to say here again that all these programs, including the British Columbia program, there must not be any job loss for a Canadian citizen or a permanent resident. Because one of the objectives of the, of the business and the entrepreneurship program and investor programs is to ensure that there is abundance of jobs for Canadian citizens and permanent residents. Uh, next, we'll look at the uh, pilot, the regional pilot program. I think I, I already uh, said a lot about this, but like we said, the, the intention is to allow the uh, smaller cities uh, around the larger cities to, to develop. Now, one of the uh, our conditions is that the, the host community, that is where the investor is going to uh, uh, put his money or his business, you must not have, uh, you, you must not have more than 75% uh, 75,000 people. And of course, that would be that would be uh, a small closely knit uh, community. And secondly, it, not, it must not be close to a large city, it must be at least more than 30 kilometers away from a large city. Again, we, we said that the reason for that is to encourage businessmen not only to settle in the larger cities, but to go into the um, smaller cities in order to uh, get them developed. Uh, the investment required, okay, the minimum network required. So let's say, for example, your, 
uh, uh, net worth is about 300,000 uh, Canadian dollars and you are not qualified for the Manitoba program, you are not qualified for the Nova Scotia one, you are not qualified for the Saskatchewan, you are not qualified for the, um, uh, for the New Brunswick, you will definitely be qualified for the uh, regional pilot program which started in, in, in 2019. So the, um, all, the, all, the, um, all the programs are, are similar, all the requirements are similar Except for the except for the fact that um, uh, the, the 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 minimum investment is a hundred thousand and the minimum net worth is three hundred thousand. So that's so that's that for the um, uh, BC uh, regional pilot program. Now we want to look at the Ontario immigrant nominee uh, program. Um, I had said earlier on that uh, previously the minimum net worth required was um, one million Canadian dollars, but uh, last year, there was uh, there was a deliberate attempt by uh, deliberate effort by the uh, Ontario office to actually encourage more investors to to come to Ontario. So the minimum network was reduced to eight hundred thousand, and that would be for businesses that are within the GTA and uh, four hundred thousand if you if you wanted to uh, establish your business outside the GTA or, for example, if the business is uh, ICT or digital uh, communication. So, so you have a dual uh, minimum uh, net worth requirement there. Uh, within, within GTA, it's gonna be 800,000. Then if it's outside GTA, uh, or if it is ICT and digital communication, it will be 400,000. Now, the investment required within the GTA is 600,000. And of course, you, you will quickly make the connection that this is very uh, close to what you had as the um, minimum network for um, a lot of the other provinces that we had looked at, uh, but you need to hold a minimum of 33.3 percent. That's a third um, of voting and equity shares in that company. And then, if it's outside the GTA, the minimum investment, the minimum amount you are required or expected to put in that business that you either acquire or you build from the scratch is 200 thousand. Then also the uh, in, uh, the uh, experience period was also reduced from a minimum of uh, three years to 24 months, which is uh, two years, but that experience must have been earned over uh, the last five years, which is like uh, 60 months. Of course, the uh, province puts in place a business performance agreement, and then the uh, English language requirement is just similar to what you have for the other provinces. Uh, is uh, five points in the IELTS, but like all other provinces we've looked at, with the exception of New Brunswick, you will also get a work permit in Ontario. Ontario does not give PR directly to business investors. Now, the, the, the uh, our strategy or maybe the, the reasoning you could say uh, for that is, is basically because the uh, uh, investor I mean, the, the, the province wants to ensure that these are very serious investors. So they, they actually want you to uh, ensure that you, 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 you know, go through all the uh, points, all the uh, uh, program that you have in your uh, business establishment uh, plan or your business plan and your business performance agreement because definitely Ontario government has a template of a business performance agreement which actually picks some of the uh, milestones in your uh, feasibility study and your business plan. They write it into the business performance agreement and you must actually check those points before um, um, you are given the nod to move to apply for um, a permanent resident. Now, basically for Ontario, you must provide at least two uh, permanent uh, full-time jobs for PR holders or Canadian citizens. Now, um, I know there, there are some people in the, in, the, in the audience, there are some participants in the audience who are saying, well, um, I, I am into farming. I don't know if there's any program that speaks to agriculture or farming. Uh, the good news is we actually have uh, a farm investment. We have farm investment programs. We're going to look at just uh, three of them. Now, so the... The farm investment uh, programs. Uh, we will do. We will do a quick uh, a comparison of the of the investment programs we have 
we are basically going to look at um, Manitoba, we we'll look at uh, Alberta, and I think we we'll look at uh, Saskatchewan as, as our guide. Now, so um, I've done I've done a little um, I've done a little graph here, uh, so we can we can have uh, a quick overview. So for the um, uh, a business, in, I mean for the uh, a farm owner or operator a program, for example, for uh, Saskatchewan, the uh, minimum net worth uh, investment required. Looking at the net worth, we are looking at five hundred thousand Canadian dollars, but for the investment. Uh, they did not particularly or categorically state how much uh, amount of, of money or capital that should go into the establishment of that fund. Now, what, what, what we've been advising our clients is that they need to look at what is uh, usually required, how much capital is required to establish a similar farm or a project in Saskatchewan. Because as you know, with, with most immigration programs, uh, it is the um, uh, um, government investment department of the immigration of every province that will look at your proposal, look at your business uh, um, uh, development plan, and maybe look at your business plan before they actually approve your investment. So we want a situation where, for example, the, the capital required or the capital you put into your business is comparable to capital that other business owners have put into, into, their, into their business. So it is, it is very important for uh, a, an investor uh, in, 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 in farm or agriculture to actually visit that, that province and actually take a sample of the, of the kind of uh, businesses that is done as well as how, uh, um, for example, they get their raw materials, how they get their uh, uh, supplies and all that. Now, if you look at Manitoba, Manitoba also has uh, the same uh, minimum net worth as Saskatchewan is uh, 500,000 Canadian dollars. Alberta has the same now. But I wanted to note something with the um, uh, farm program in Alberta. For the investment that is required, they are actually looking at 500,000. So wait for it. The net worth is 500,000. They're also asking for 500,000 capital to go into, into that business. Now, but if you, if you look at the conditions under which uh, they want you to invest, they are saying they want uh, uh, a financial institution that is located in Alberta to actually provide that finance, okay? So what that, what that means is that for, for you to be able to uh, start a farm business in Alberta, you must not only have a minimum net worth of 500,000, you must also have done your homework properly. You've prepared your business plan. You've done your feasibility. You've done your expression of interest. You are able to show your experience. You must also be able to convince a bank located in Alberta to actually give you uh, uh, a loan in order to start in order to start that uh, business. Now, so um, looking at um, experience for the for the farm uh, businesses. Uh, for Alberta, they just mentioned, uh, you know, experience is required. They didn't put a number of years of experience, but we will always uh, advise that uh, every investor will have a minimum of three years provable and solid experience, full-time experience. It must not be that uh, the a businessman or the, or the farm investor uh, was doing farming on a part-time basis. It must, it must be on, on a full-time Basis. Now, so for, for Manitoba, they are looking at three years, but for Saskatchewan, they have not mentioned any number of years. Again, we advise that um, you have an experience not less than uh, three years, but more importantly, the number of years of experience should not be less than the experience that similar businesses in Saskatchewan actually has. So for expression of interest, uh, Saskatchewan does not require an expression of interest to start the uh, uh, farm project, but Manitoba requires that. Uh, Manitoba, like we said, they don't require expression of interest, but they wanted it to do an exploratory visit. Of course, if you need to convince the banks in Alberta to give you 500,000, which is half a million uh, cool Canadian dollars, you need to visit them and you need to hold meetings with them. Now, for the other um, uh, conditions we have here, 
Saskatchewan uh, is looking for a refundable deposit of uh, 75,000 uh, Canadian dollars. There must be a, a farm establishment plan. Then, of course, as, as it sees with all other uh, provincial nomination programs, uh, they grant a work permit first, and then the PR after the terms of the work permit have been fully implemented. Now, the, the same thing for uh, Manitoba, uh, very, very similar uh, condition to that of Saskatchewan, but uh, we need not say anything more about, um, about the uh, Alberta one. So I will, I will move quickly over the uh, farm programs because I've done a summary just to give you a general overview. And, and like I said, again, what, what the provincial programs will do is to grant a, a, a work permit as a stopgap, uh, within which time the, um, the, the, the government will assess your capability, your experience, and how well you have managed the uh, business uh, for, them to, uh, for, them to, for them to actually do, do that. So next, we're gonna uh, look at the Quebec uh, programs. Uh, basically, there are, there, are, there are three programs uh, we will be we'll be looking at uh, the first one, which is very popular, which everyone knows, is the uh, Quebec Immigrant Investor Program. Uh, they also have the uh, Quebec Entrepreneurship Programs, which are in two streams. Then uh, Quebec also has a self-employed program. Uh, we said in in the beginning that uh, Quebec has its own uh, um, immigration stream because there's there, there's there's this agreement with the with the federal government of of Canada. Is called the uh, uh, Canada uh, Quebec Accord, and this was signed in 1991. The objective is to enable uh, uh, Quebec to preserve its cultural and demographic um, um, uh, culture. So um, they have they have the opportunity, they have the uh, permission of the of the federal government to actually uh, handle their own uh, uh, immigration. And you will see what what has been done now. So we're looking at the Quebec. Uh, investor immigration program. This is the uh, most popular program. And you know, I mentioned something when we were looking at the New Brunswick program. I said, apart from the New Brunswick and the uh, Quebec program, all other programs, you need to start a business. Now, but for the Quebec investor immigration program, it is, it is a passive investment. So you don't need to um, uh, buy a business in Quebec. You don't need to do uh, a business establishment plan. You don't need to look for managers to manage a business. All you are supposed to do is to invest money into the uh, province of Quebec, and that money goes to the government of Quebec. And what the government of Quebec uh, does with that money is to provide services for the uh, citizens and the uh, uh, people who live in the, in the whole province of Quebec. So the way they look at it is that you are, you are giving a donation, which is refundable at the end of five years. Now, I want us to go into that. The minimum net worth for investors into this program is $2 million Canadian dollars. I think um, if, if my calculation is correct, that should be around 1.6 million uh, US, US dollars. Now, the, the amount of investment required out of that is 1.2 million. Now, there's an option for the investor to actually fund this 1.2 million from um, a provincially approved uh, syndicate of banks. So what they do is, if you are interested in migrating to Quebec under this program, number one, you must be able to account for two million um, a net worth, two million Canadian dollars net worth. Then secondly, you must be able to provide 1.2 million as a, a donation, five years donation to the government. But if you say, oh, I know what I can do with $1.2 million. And within five years, I'm going to triple that money. That is, that is acceptable. So what you need to do is to approach some uh, uh, banks, uh, a syndicated uh, a loan from, from those banks, but they are in Quebec and they are approved by government. So I must say that the uh, amount of $1.2 million that you are giving to the government of Quebec is actually risk-free because you will definitely get back the money after five years. But 
Let's imagine that you wanted to invest that money by yourself. You can actually approach some government approved uh, a bank syndicate who will actually lend you this, this uh, fund. Uh, the experience they are looking for is minimum of two years business management experience, or it must be uh, within the last five years. And we said, of course, that, that, there, that there must be, um, that it is, it is a passive investment. You don't, need, uh, you don't need a business plan and all that. Now, uh, there may be interview uh, required by the, by the Quebec uh, immigration, they are called MIDI, MIDI. Uh, they, may, they, may, they may want you to come for an interview to know the kind of person you are, to understand your, your business experience. But of course, we said earlier on that you are not going to uh, buy any business unless you just want to invest in Quebec, of course. But it is not a requirement of this program. And more importantly, immediately you are approved, you are given a PR. So for two provinces in Canada, you have. Uh, both uh, New Brunswick as well as Quebec giving the applicant PR straight. But of course, you've, you've also noted the uh, conditions under which uh, that, that will happen. Uh, last year in November, November 2019, last year, the government of Quebec temporarily suspended this program until July 2020. And the reason is that um, they, they want to look at uh, some of the selection criteria and all the requirements for, for this program. So we expect to hear something from them in, in July or, or after July. But for those of our clients whose application are pending, please, uh, we want you to be assured that your applications are being considered. We're in touch with the uh, government office. Now, for the uh, Quebec entrepreneurship programs, like we said, there are two, there are two streams, but the, it's a very limited uh, uh, opportunity here, and they are only accepting just about 60 uh, applications in all. The, the minimum network required is 500,000, but there must be a deposit uh, made by the uh, prospective applicant. Basically, if the business is required to be in uh, Montreal, the amount is 300,000. If it is outside Montreal, it's uh, 200,000. But if the investor is acquiring a, a business, he must own a minimum of 51%. But if he's establishing a business, you can actually join with others. And the minimum um, uh, uh, percentage of investment must be 25%. But as with other provincial programs, and this is not similar to the um, uh, QIP, a PR will only be obtained after the uh, selection certificate has been received from uh, Quebec. Of course, uh, there must be a performance guarantee uh, to show that um, uh, you are, you are self-sufficient. And they will also look at the, um, the, 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 the source of the funds. By the way, that is a very, very important and a key uh, aspect of, of what the government of Canada will do. There must be a very rigorous uh, anti-money laundering check, as well as uh, to show uh, how the um, investor actually made up the money over, over, the, over the years. Now, we want to do something very quickly here. We want to compare the provincial programs with the owner operator program. And this will most probably just sum up uh, what the message we are trying to pass across about the provincial programs vis-a-vis uh, -vis the on our operator program. Now, for the, for the net worth, like we said, most of the provincial programs, they are looking at net worth of between, uh, oh, that, that should have been 300,000 300, to about 1.2 uh, million, but the owner operator, none. They don't require evidence of a particular amount of net worth. Now, the investment uh, amount that is required for most uh, provinces, like we've seen, it starts from 150,000. For example, in um, Manitoba, you have some other provinces going to about 200, some are 250,000. And you remember the BC uh, Entrepreneurship uh, Pilot Program, which is the uh, lowest. Uh, it goes for about 100,000 minimum investment. But for the owner operator, again, it's not specified. Not specified. Now, the uh, timing for progressing from application to PR. Uh, we're looking at provincial program. The fastest period will probably be in the region of between 24 months to 48 months now. But 
we need to we need to make something very clear there. Now, when the when the uh, provincial government when they say that they are giving uh, a a I mean they are giving their word to say the uh, processing of this application will be six months, for example, they are talking about from the time when all documents are complete, all forms filled, uh, money paid, and all questions answered. Now. Let's say they start processing that uh, application and they discover that uh, there, are some, there are some issues, for example, with uh, the declarations. Maybe you've traveled to Canada before and you said you've never traveled to Canada. I'm just using that as, as an example. And if they should write a letter to you to ask you to explain why there was a discrepancy, that number of months or years that they have indicated to you automatically freezes. So if, if you like, they stop the clock. Now, when everything is complete again, they restart the, the clock. So a lot of the time, um, it, is, it, is, it is actually due to the uh, assistance of the, of the, of the clients them, themselves. If you have a list of documents, for example, that your consultant or your lawyer has asked you to provide, you must be uh, you know, up to date in providing all those information. Because uh, uh, Canadian immigration uh, can be really very, very detailed, very, very, very detailed. Now, so for, for, for provincial, we're looking at between 24 months to about, about 48 months, but uh, most of the time uh, to reach PR, it might go, it might go above 24, may go above 24 months. Now for the owner operator, I'm gonna pause a little bit here and explain. Now, so for the owner operator, uh, the business acquisition is as fast as the investor wants it. So let's say today you're an investor and you're in Dubai and you're listening to me right now. You want to come to Canada on the owner operator business. All you need to do is for you to look for a business that you can buy in Canada. As soon as you can get on a plane, come to Canada, consult, and then go ahead and acquire the company. When you acquire the company, the company will apply for a business work permit for you. Uh, usually, there is supposed to be an LMIA for every, every work permit, as you know, because this is a work permit, even though it's a business work permit, but there's still an LMIA. Now, LMIA, for those who don't know, is Labor Market Impact Assessment. What that means is that before an applicant or a worker is given permission to come and work, uh, you know, if, if it's a foreigner, of course, wants to come and work in Canada, the government office, the HRDC, they need to verify that there is no other person in Canada who has those skills, who has those experience, you know, in order to take up that job. So you are saying, if you're applying for LMIA, that, oh, I'm the only one who can do this job. Now, for business immigration, for the owner-operator option, because you have put down your money to buy the business. So let's imagine that you, you know, you've, you've signed an agreement to buy the business, you've put money in an, in an escrow account, because that's, that's one of the requirements. You put in an escrow account, you've signed a, a binding agreement to actually purchase that business, and you apply for an LMIA. What you are telling the Canadian government, as well as the HRDC, Human Resource Development Canada, is that I am qualified and I have the skills, I have the managerial experience to manage my business. So, you need to submit all the documents relating to your acquisition, relating to your experience. Now, because of the nature of that acquisition, LMIA is most of the time dispensed with, or it is, it is, it is over and done with within the shortest possible time, between a period of two to three months. Now, once you get the LMIA, the next stage is to apply for the work permit. I mean, automatically, if you have, if you have, the, if you have the LMIA, um, and let's say, for example, you are on the Federal Express entry. If you, if you plug in the points for your LMIA, automatically that is 200 points. So let's say you even had like maybe 300 points in at the Federal Express entry pool, and you bought a business in, in, in Canada, and then you got your LMIA and you plug it into your Express entry, automatically you are you know, approved to go to the second stage for PR on the express entry portal. But let's even assume that you don't have uh, the express entry portal. Let's say you are just a businessman. You didn't want to come in as a skilled immigrant. Now, once you get your LMIA, you apply for 
a work permit because one of the things you need to submit, of course, is your, is your LMIA. And once you get that, you are on your way to Canada. So we are looking at a period of below six months for you from the period when you think about buying this business and coming to Canada and actually coming to Canada. And the work permit, of course, allows you, your spouse and your children to live and study and work, especially for yourself and your, and your spouse in Canada. Okay, so that is how uh, the owner operator compares favorably with the provincial program. Now for the ownership, uh, the owner operator, you must have a controlling share. If you bought the company, and you're coming in to uh, run it, like we said earlier on, you must not be liable to being fired and you can only secure that position if you have majority shares. And that's a minimum of 51% uh, or 50.5. But of course, uh, there's nothing stopping you from owning your business uh, 100%. But for the uh, provincial programs, uh, they are looking at a minimum of uh, one third. That's 33.3 or 33.5. Now, for expression of interest, for most uh, provincial programs, this is required. But for owner operator, not required. Exploratory visit, for some uh, provinces, if you are buying a business, it is required. For some others, it is not required. But for owner operator, definitely it is not required. And for uh, ILTS also, there's not a formal requirement for uh, uh, ILTS, but uh, definitely uh, for you to get um, your PR through, you still have to show that uh, you have the uh, uh, language qualification. Okay, so um, our conclusion on the provincial business and the, and the owner operator uh, option is that for, for a lot of uh, investors or a lot of entrepreneurs, um, you should actually give the owner operator uh, an option, a very, very good consideration, okay? Right, I, I want us to look at um, another uh, uh, part of our, our program that we offer here in our, our top market, it's called uh, Citizenship by Investment. Now, you must, you must understand that all the other programs, all the other options that we have looked at, is looking at a situation where that investor or that prospective applicant wants to come into Canada to come and live in the work, school, study, uh, you know, and all that. Now, but some of our clients have come to us and they've told us, okay, the kind of business I do uh, in my country right now, I cannot leave my country to come and live in Canada, but I want a situation where I can travel all over the world you know, and I have some kind of passport that gives me visa-free access to a lot of countries now. So this is citizenship by investment. There are some countries, uh, mostly in the Caribbean as well as uh, Europe, that will, um, that will give um, their, their, their passport to uh, persons who are found worthy, who have invested in their economy. And we are gonna look at uh, some of them. I mean, by no means, uh, it is not exhaustive, but the ones that, uh, that are uh, you know, commonly seen, and the ones that we have actually uh, submitted uh, applicants and our clients for, uh, we, we, we will discuss them very quickly. Now, uh, like we said, some of these um, are citizen by investment programs, you'll find them in the Caribbean, we have the Dominican Republic, we have Grenada, we have Antigua, we have St. Kitts and, and, and Newville. Then in Europe, we have Malta, Ireland, Bulgaria, Portugal, and all that. Now, so for most of them, the investment uh, required can be anything as little as 150,000 USD is United States dollars, because as you know, this is not a, a Canadian uh, program. So the amount of net worth and the amount of donation or the investment is actually denominated in um, uh, US, US dollars. Now, I want us to look at the citizenship uh, by investment, uh, especially the Antigua and, um, and Barbuda. Now, so uh, the, the government of uh, Antigua in the year 2013 actually uh, established this um, a program where uh, they allow uh, persons of you know, citizens of other nations who have been uh, uh, checked, who, you know, they've done due diligence on them, and then 
they give them the opportunity to apply for uh, a passport for uh, Antigua and Barbuda. For, for Antigua and, and Barbuda, the, the total uh, processing period is uh, between three to six months from the time when you apply for the passport to when the passport is, um, is actually granted. I mean, when the uh, approval is given and passport is actually granted. And, and what is more interesting is that the uh, government of Antigua and Barbuda allows dual citizenship. So let's say, for example, um, you're a citizen of Iran or Iraq, or you're a citizen of, of maybe Israel or any other country. The uh, government of Antigua and Barbuda will allow you to keep your citizenship of your current uh, country, and then uh, they, you will still be uh, a citizen of Antigua and, um, and Barbuda. Now, so for Antigua and Barbuda, the visa-free access uh, covers about 165 countries. Um, a lot of them are in, are in Europe. Most of the countries in Europe, the Antigua passport gives you a visa-free access to all those um, countries. And uh, some of them, of course, are UK, Hong Kong, Russia, India, Turkey, China, and, and others. Now, I'll, I'll, I'll give you a, a very good example of how useful this, this, this can actually uh, be. Uh, I, met, I met a client um, at a time, I think, I think about two years ago, and when I, when I introduced him to the Assisi by Investment Program, he, he really didn't know there was anything like that before because what it does is that he's, he's, a, he's a businessman and he travels, he travels all over the world for businesses and all that. Now, what he said was that sometimes there is an opportunity in a particular country, but because he needs to apply for uh, an entry visa into that country or into, or into those uh, uh, countries, he needs to actually uh, you know, wait for a period of maybe a month while they process the visa. Uh, visa processing times for most countries, I mean, as, you, as you may all be aware, uh, will probably not be less than maybe, maybe like 30 days. Uh, for some countries that, that we know of, it's probably like 90 days. For some, it can go on and on and on. And for a businessman, you want to be able to grab your passport one day, you can get a call from your friend in Turkey or in China or in Hong Kong, or in Australia, and it wants you to come and close a business deal. All you need to do is to pick your passport, phone your uh, a travel agency, or buy online from hobbies or, or whichever, and then get on, get on a plane because you don't need to apply for a visa. Now, that is what the Citizenship and Investment Program does for you. It gives you a visa-free access to a lot of countries. Now, um, there, are, there are other uh, countries which passports will give you visa-free access to countries. There are some will give you about 100, some will give you about 90, some will give you maybe about 60, others will give you about 130. Now, but the reason we are talking about Antigua and Barbuda especially is that this is, this is a, a program that we've, we, we've filed applications for, and we have a very good working relationship with the uh, our government agency. And if you're even looking at the value, you know, uh, a money for value, you know, the Antigua and Barbuda uh, passport ranks uh, much better than, uh, than a lot of those um, other ones because for the, for the amount of money that, that you need to spend to acquire that passport, you actually have uh, a lot more countries that you have visa-free access into. So um, for Antigua and Barbuda, for example, there's no restriction on repatriation of profits uh, or capital gains, no, no personal or income tax, no inheritance tax. And then of course, your accountant or your, or your tax practitioner will, will tell you, uh, these are some of the countries where you have a very good uh, a, a tax planning. Uh, you can have an, an offshore uh, a bank account, you know, uh, and all that. And of course, let's look at the kind of investments that you can do in this country in order to get their uh, a passport and, and citizenship. So uh, first, the uh, principal applicant, that is the one who applies now, must be minimum of 18 years old before he can be the uh, principal uh, applicant. And of course, some of the investments uh, uh, will relate to, for example, the uh, National Development Fund. Uh, that, that's like a donation to the, to the country. So what they've done is that for any family, any, any principal applicant whose family is just four, 
uh, the minimum amount that you pay, I mean, the maximum amount that you pay is 100,000 USD to be able to apply with members of your family who in total must not be more than four. That is, you have the principal applicant, you have the spouse, then you have two children. Now, if that is the family configuration, the total amount you are paying for the application is 100,000. Of course, there are some other uh, government fees and expenses like passport fees, application fees, um, due diligence fees, you know, all those ones are there. And I think that th those ones will probably go to another maybe 60,000 or 70,000 uh, USD. Now, but for a family of five, the amounts payable for the NDF, that's the National Development Fund, which of course that we have said is like a donation to the uh, government of Antigua and Barbuda. Of course, it is non-refundable. This is uh, understood to be a way uh, in which investors are helping uh, the uh, government of, of, of the nation to uh, you know, actually pursue some of his programs for his defense and for um, health and all, and all those ones. So uh, that's, that's that for the uh, donation. Now, but if you would rather like to invest in real estate, there's also a real estate option and you can invest in a government approved real estate uh, project for a, a minimum of five years. And the amount of the minimum investment is uh, 400,000 uh, USD. Uh, thirdly, the, uh, the other option you have, of course, is to buy government approved uh, businesses or shares in, in businesses. And the minimum amount for this is also 400,000 uh, USD, uh, not, not Canadian dollars, because like we said, uh, this, is, this is not a Canada program, it's an international program uh, which uh, we are running here in top market attorneys with um, agencies. Now, so we also, you should also know that uh, the spouse, of course, and children are, are qualified. And we also say that uh, the uh, processing time is uh, an average of uh, six months. Uh, once all the documentation requirements are, are complete, the uh, agreed time is six months. Of course, it could come before that, but uh, basically looking at um, six months. Um, looking at uh, the, the uh, value of this, of this particular program, uh, we will say that we have been uh, very successful in uh, selling this uh, program to uh, a lot of, of our clients because they look at the value for money. They also look at the processing time and they look uh, also at the fact that they don't need to have any commitment uh, to live in Antigua and Barbuda. Actually, for the for that, for that program, the only residency requirement, if you can call it that, is that you must uh, stay in Antigua and Barbuda for uh, a minimum of five days within a five-year period. So let's assume you go there every year, you spend the night. You will have qualified, you will have retained your uh, citizenship. Now, since we are talking about citizenship, we want to return to Canada and uh, we were talking about how to become a permanent resident, but just to tell all the uh, prospective applicants for the permanent residency program in Canada that there is a pathway to citizenship. Um, a lot of our clients have asked us the question, oh, how can I qualify for a citizenship? I mean, for Canada, there's no citizenship by investment program. It is only in those countries that we have actually uh, looked at. You know, some of the countries in the Caribbean as well as in Europe. In Canada, there's no straight pathway to becoming a citizen. You must be a permanent resident for a number of years. We now go into these slides and just see that now. So we say in order to apply for citizenship, you need to have resided in Canada physically for a period of three out of five years. So give a very, very good example. So you became a, a, a permanent resident this year. You cannot become um, a citizen until three years time. That is, there is, um, there is, a, there is a, there's a calculator that you actually use online, which records when did you arrive in Canada? When did you leave? When did you arrive again? When did you leave? So at the, at the end of the day, that uh, um, uh, calculator will actually show you if you have spent the required number of days within Canada. And if I remember quite correctly, I think that is 1,095 days, which you must uh, be able to account for in a five-year period. And the, the uh, reference date is the, is the date is five years 
before you are, you are, you are making an application for citizenship. Of course, um, you must have demonstrated that you are a good uh, a citizen or a good permanent resident. You must have filed your, your taxes. Those are some of the things that the um, government will, will want to see. Of course, you must continue to have English or French language uh, abilities. Uh, if you want to become a, a Canadian citizen, then there's something that is called the knowledge test. The knowledge test uh, is made up of about 20 uh, questions, just asking you about uh, you know, Canadian way of life, Canadian history, and all that. You must be able to uh, get about 16 uh, out of those uh, questions uh, correctly. And of course, as usual, for all Canadian programs, there must not be any prohibitions due to criminality or admissibilities or, 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 any, or any kind of problem. Now, so after you must have submitted the application for citizenship and you are approved, uh, you'll be given an invitation to attend the citizenship ceremony. Now, that is the day that you tell yourself you have now become a Canadian citizen because you are gonna be sworn in by a citizenship judge. Usually there is a, there's a bit of ceremony and you can, you can actually uh, invite your, your friends, uh, parents, uh, you know, and, and all your all your well wishes to to come for your for your for your ceremony. So you take the old oath of allegiance, uh, saying that you will fulfill all the conditions uh, for becoming uh, a citizen of Canada. And after you take that oath, you can apply for your for your passport. Okay, you need you if I mean if you need to travel, whether you apply for passport uh, does not really matter. Once you take the oath of allegiance, you'll be given a citizenship certificate. That is, that is what shows that you're a Canadian citizen. If you want to travel, you can apply for the, for the passport, and then you go through that, and then, and then you, have your, you have your little black book uh, with you. So I'm sure at this stage, um, you, will, you will actually be uh, wondering that um, I did make mention of, of uh, uh, some things in the beginning when we, when we talked about how would you like to wear your shoes. Um, I did show, I did show the pictures of um, a, a someone. Uh, let me see whether I can. Uh, I'll just see whether I can, what I can get back to that. Now, the reason I show that picture is just to, is just to see how you would like to choose the person who works with you as you, you know, go through this journey of becoming a Canadian permanent resident. Um, in, in Canada here, there are some uh, people who are uh, legally certified to be able to represent you before the uh, uh, immigration. They are, they are consultants and they are also uh, lawyers. Um, you can, you can uh, employ or engage the services of any approved uh, group of persons uh, to do that for you. But of course, um, uh, you must know that um, the reason the man on the left hand side is wearing his shoes that way was, was because his shoes are pathetically undersized. But the man on the right is wearing uh, his shoes very confidently because his shoes are the right fit. Now, let me, let, let's, let's look at the next slide. Now, I said, I told you something about Cinderella's shoes. I said that um, when a lot of us were growing up, we, you know, we read the story of Cinderella or maybe Maybe we watch the uh, movies. For those who are maybe slightly younger, they made it into, into movies. And you remember that uh, Cinderella, of course, uh, was the choice of the prince, right? But because she had to go back to her wicked uh, stepmother, she forgot this uh, wonderful looking uh, shoe that you have here. And when the time came for the prince to actually uh, take his wife, the wicked stepmother, attempted to make her own daughters uh, the favorite uh, or, or the bride to be of the, of, of the prince. But the prince said, well, the one who is Cinderella left her shoes with me and I brought those shoes. And if indeed any of your daughters is Cinderella, she must be able to wear these shoes. Of course, the weakest stepmother tried and tried and tried, but the legs of her two daughters could not go into the shoes. The question I asked when I was much younger for my teacher was, why did that happen? My teacher told me, but now I've since known that that was not true. 
my teacher told me that it was because um, uh, Cinderella's uh, stepmother was very wicked. Yes, she, she was wicked, but the real reason they couldn't fit was because Cinderella's shoes were tailor-made, tailor-made. So what am I saying? I'm saying that even sisters may wear different shoe sizes. Okay, so a lot of um, a lot of clients, I don't want you to say, oh, this was what my friend did and he got permanent resident. Oh, this was what somebody did and he got now. The shoe of your friend may not be your size. So <laughs> the uh, moral in my story is that even if you are a sister or a friend to someone who had tried something to become a permanent resident, you need to seek professional advice before you actually try the same shoes or you may end up wearing your shoes the way the man on the left is wearing his own shoes. He's only putting his toes in, in, in the shoes. So we are all very unique uh, in our own ways and we need to seek uh, professional advice that is uh, qualitative with people of great experience and people who have actually uh, assisted other immigrants to uh, perfect their, their dreams. So like I said uh, earlier on, we are going to have more uh, webinars like this. Uh, the next notable one is, is coming up on June 10th, like we said, and that's going to be the uh, Express Entry uh, a, a program, the Skilled Immigration Program. I'm sure there are many people who, are, who attended today's uh, session who wanted to actually learn more about the business uh, immigration program, but uh, don't despair. Come June the 10th, uh, you will definitely have an opportunity to uh, uh, learn more about the uh, skilled immigration program. Now, so we've come to the end of our, our presentation at, at this evening. I want to thank us all for our patience, uh, in observing all the all the rules, uh, before I open the um, uh, microphone as well as the uh, chat box to answer questions, uh, our our uh, address is shown there: Top McKay Attorneys in Canada, Two Lansing Square, Toronto. Our phone number and all that you have them there. We also do have a a, a contact office um, in Lagos, Nigeria. Uh, for those who are in that in that region, you you can always uh, contact that that office. Then that's the end. Thank you very much. Thank you everyone for uh, joining the uh, our program today. Uh, we look forward to seeing you again on June the 10th. Thank you and have a good evening.